Hello everyone, my name is Jess McIntosh and I'm uh, from the University of Bristol and I'm here today to present my work on ultrasound imaging for hand gesture recognition. So what I want you to take away from this talk is uh, to understand what ultrasound imaging is and how you can use it to detect hand gestures. Uh, the advantages that this uh, technique has over existing methods and uh, the problems in its current state that prohibit it from being a method that, we ca that can be used today. So before we go into ultrasound imaging, I just want to quickly talk about gestures in the background for this work. So uh, we use gestures to communicate with each other. It's a, it's a natural thing for us to do. Uh, it's easy for us to do and to understand. And uh, clearly this person looks very happy doing a gesture. So um, we see devices are increasingly becoming integrated into our surroundings, such as uh, smart devices in homes, uh, wearable devices. Uh, so there's a growing need for uh, a convenient method to control them, and, uh, which is always available to us. And this is the term that Sapona Satel used in their paper, and I think it captures quite well the necessity and the requirements for such a device. So what are the requirements for such a device? Well, it has to be portable and probably wearable. Uh, it has to be ergonomic, so people need to be happy to wear this thing. And it has to be accurate for a, a range of different gestures. Uh, this is a bit of a loose thing because it depends on the application, but uh, I'll elaborate on this later on. So a multitude of different um, uh, approaches have been developed in the past. Um, uh, yet so far, the, there does not seem to be any work within the HCI community that acknowledges ultrasound imaging as a means of detecting gestures. So one of the key aims of this talk is to make this technique known among fellow researchers in this field. And uh, for this reason, I won't delve into too much detail into our own investigations, but I will briefly um, go over the findings that we, that we saw. Um, but one may ask, uh, why should we use ultrasound imaging over existing methods? And uh, we'll come back to this question at the end when we know more about it. So for the rest of this talk, I'll uh, give you a brief primer on ultrasound imaging and how it works. Uh, I'll talk about uh, our own investigations. Uh, I'll talk a bit about uh, the practicality issues that need solving as well. OK, so what is ultrasound imaging? So most of you are probably familiar with the uh, pregnancy scans like you can see here. So just to be clear, when I say ultrasound imaging, I mean uh, imaging of human tissue and not imaging in midair. So this, take, uh, this technique has another name. It's called uh, ultrasonography. And ultrasonography has been around for some decades now. It's not a new technique. It's, uh, it's been developed quite heavily over the recent years. And uh, it's been researched almost exclusively for clinical applications. So uh, there are, in fact, some past work that uses ultrasound imaging for detecting gestures. But these research, uh, this research is uh, typically assistive uh, technology purposes. Uh, for example, uh, controlling prosthetic hands or for rehabilitation, as listed in these, these two works here. Uh, but we can easily apply this technique uh, for interaction with computers. So here's a brief primer on the fundamental principles of ultrasonography. So in this basic scenario, we have a single transducer, and uh, the transducer emits a sound wave, and it hits an object at some distance away, and this creates an echo, which is then detected by the same transducer. So in this case, we know the distance away from the sensor, but we do not know its position in 2D. So here's a more realistic situation, where a transducer is pulsing sound into the human body, and the graph represents the intensity of the echo received by the transducer. And peaks occur when there is a large change in acoustic impedance uh, between mediums. So this might be, for instance, uh, from bone to uh, muscle or even between uh, uh, the muscle and the skin. But we can't form an image from this yet. So we just know the distance away again. Uh, but by using multiple transducers, uh, the lateral location of an object can be calculated. Uh, and this is the basic gist of ultrasound imaging. It's a lot more complicated than this, uh, but uh, you can imagine, you know, if you uh, scale this up and do a lot more uh, processing, you can formulate an image. So uh, anyway, these transducer arrays are housed in a, a handheld probe, which may come in uh, many shapes and sizes. And when the probe is held to the skin, uh, the underlying tissue can be imaged. 
and you get an image that looks a bit like this. So uh, the probe surface to it is towards the top, uh, and these images are quite hard to interpret, but basically the bright areas indicate boundaries where there is a, a change between different types of tissues. Uh, for instance, in the, uh, in the bottom right, the black blob there is, uh, is the bone. Uh, and images can be obtained at multiple frames per second. Uh, and now here you can see the muscle fibers uh, shifting around. Sorry. Okay. Um, as the hand moves. Uh, now I want you to pay attention to how different these images look and the different probe placements and orientations. And uh, the movement is especially different in the longitudinal plane as shown here. Uh, as the fibers move in the direction of the muscle, as opposed to the transverse orientation here, where the muscles and tendons kind of shift around each other and rotate. Okay, so uh, we found that in the related work, uh, the position of the probe was never justified, um, and so we decided to find out if there was any significant difference between positions and any advantages that one position may have. Uh, so we conducted a study with 12 participants and we instructed them to perform 10 discrete gestures wearing this apparatus as shown here. And uh, each participant re repeated the experiment with the probe placed at different locations. This is the gesture set that we used. Um, so it, comprises, it is comprised of uh, some wrist gestures, some finger gestures uh, for a wide variety of sort of the biomechanics of the hand. Um, and we also split this gesture set up into flexion and, and extension sub-gestures, so kind of a, a total of 20 gestures, but really only, only 10. And to actually recognize the gestures, we used uh, the dense optical flow, and uh, we used these features as input to a, a neural network to classify the gestures. And here are the tenfold cross-validation accuracies for each position. So we obtained high accuracies with an average close to 99%, uh, which aligns with uh, accuracies found in, uh, in previous work. Um, but overall, there's not really a huge difference among locations, except for perhaps the, uh, the longitudinal location, which performs slightly worse than the others. And uh, we suspect that this was due to the, uh, the image plane not intersecting with uh, the muscles either side of the, uh, the central location. And this is in contrast to the transverse uh, image plane, where uh, this technique would work well because it has good coverage of the tendons that pass through the carpal tunnel, for example, or the, uh, the muscles that are located more proximally. So as with uh, similar methods, uh, this technique suffers from sensor misalignment between sessions. So in our study, we also made uh, participants uh, repeat a location, uh, taking the probe off the arm and back on again. And in this example, we can see a shift has occurred in the image between the sessions, uh, which you can tell due to, for instance, uh, the shifting as the bone marked here and the archery here. So we created a simple realignment algorithm to mitigate this issue, uh, using the same optical flow algorithm to estimate the shift, and then using this as estimation to correct the image in the second session. So now you can see that the bones have aligned. And what we found from our cross-session analysis was that in each location, uh, this realignment algorithm does improve the classification accuracy. Um, but again, the worst performance by far was the longitudinal location. And uh, we suspect this is because um, shifts perpendicular to the image plane um, drastically changes the image, and a simple, a simple image translation cannot fix this, uh, whereas it can be uh, fixed in transverse shifts. Uh, and in addition to discrete gestures, we also tested uh, uh, finger flex angle estimation. So uh, these are necessary for control of a variable on a continuous scale. So uh, we in fact instrumented the previous experiment with a data glove uh, consisting of bend sensors uh, in order to collect the ground truth data. And uh, we used this data to uh, train a neural network regressor uh, to estimate the angle for each finger. So we estimated the, uh, the angles for fingers, uh, the first to fifth digits. 
And then uh, we used a, uh, a normalized root mean square error as a metric for performance. Uh, we averaged these over all the fingers. And uh, we found that the results were, again, quite similar across all test uh, positions with no significant advantage at any location. Uh, so to summarize our findings, um, we found that discrete gesture recognition works well at all locations, um, but robustness is an issue for the longitudinal image plane, as we can see in the cross-session scenario. Um, and we also found that uh, continuous finger tracking is possible at all locations too. Um, so why should we use ultrasound imaging over existing techniques? Well, we're networked very accurately, and uh, not just in this work, but also in prior work. Uh, it can be used in a variety of placements, which allows for ergonomic design. So I'm not here to argue that a particular position is more ergonomic than the, another, but uh, that you have a choice here. And lastly, con uh, continuous gesture recognition is a possibility that works in all locations. And this is quite impor an important interaction for, uh, quite, for control of a lot of um, different, uh, you know, various scale variables. Um, however, that's not to say that ultrasound imaging does not have its uh, practical issues. So um, the major concern for the future of this technology is uh, with acoustic coupling. So uh, in its current state, it's, uh, it's not feasible because um, of a loss in transmission. I'll, I'll elaborate on this, on this in a sec. Um, and second of all, uh, the size, power, and cost, but uh, these are uh, due to um, kind of decrease over time. So acoustic coupling is, um, is necessary because without this, uh, the transmission is very low and uh, the medium is, is there to provide a good transmission coefficient into the flesh. So normally ultrasound gel is used, which is fine for clinical applications where uh, one might go for a scan and it will be done in 10 seconds. And if the, if the gel dries up, it doesn't really matter. Um, so there hasn't really been much motivation for a long-lasting dry pad. Uh, recently, though, a few rigid uh, polymer gels have been put, uh, developed, but they're still designed for clinical use and aren't meant to last a long time. So this needs further investigation for sure. Uh, and now you might be wondering what the driving equipment for the probe looks like. Uh, so what is, what is this attached to and uh, how we might mount this onto our arms? Um, well, uh, this is quite a challenge. Uh, but fortunately, uh, they've actually decreased in size over the years uh, to the point where the driving circuitry can be contained within the probe handle itself and a smartphone is able to process the data. Um, and power and cost are still issues, but these aspects are expected to improve over time. And furthermore, we might be able to reduce the image size and crop the parts that aren't necessary, for example, the top of the skin or the parts with the bones. And uh, we may also be, uh, be able to reduce the resolution and still be able to recognize different gestures and, and the kind of the motion of the, of the muscle fibers. Uh, that further uh, reduces complexity, power, and cost. Um, and image frame rate is also another variable that can be altered. Uh, in our studies, we used a, a frame rate of about 30 frames per second. And finally, uh, probes are usually designed so that they can scan uh, numerous locations. Um, but if we know where we want to have it, we can place uh, this device statically and design the probes to fit around the geometry of our arms, uh, which may provide better coverage of muscles and tendons. So in this image, um, the, the linear probe cannot uh, image the bits in red, uh, but these bits can be covered in the, in the uh, different array configuration where it's kind of covering the, the top parts of the arm. So to summarize, I hope that you've now understood what ultrasound imaging in tissue is and its potential for accurate gesture detec detection along with uh, ergonomic device placement and continuous angle estimation. Uh, but most importantly, the, uh, the key practicality issues that require further investigation here to make this technology feasible. Um, and I hope that someone goes away today and tries to find a way to make that happen. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'll happily take your questions now. Hi, Gregory About from Georgia Tech. Interesting talk. I, I missed a little bit on the continuous tracking because from your images you showed a kind of a way you did a static measurement 
uh, and then you showed some results and magically said that that results in being able to continuously measure it. Uh, um, presumably, yeah. when you were doing the, uh, the ground truth study with people, you let them just position all their fingers however they wanted, or did you have them do it in a fixed way? No, all right. So um, what we did was we, uh, we let the participants uh, kind of flex from like this position to a full flex of a single finger. And uh, we collected the data over time. And so in the regressor, what we did was uh, at each kind of position in time, we uh, trained the regressor with the ultrasound image features. Does that kind of help? Right, so they could do anything with the other fingers. Uh, yeah, well, they, I'm, they... Just, I'm just curious. Uh, doing this and doing this are very different, and I don't know whether you'd be able to continuously the, track that. So we, the individual fingers were flexed uh, in a way which was kind of the most natural, you know, if that, you know, you know so. But you probably couldn't do the, all fingers at once from your results? Um, that's something that is to be investigated, I think. Uh, I mean, you could maybe do it, but this is not what we're, we're, we're trying to do here. Hi, uh, Kent Lyons from Technicolor. Um, thanks for doing this work. It's been on my list for a long time, so it's good to see some results. Um, I'm curious if you could um, talk a little bit about your algorithm and why you did, like, f for the replacement of the technology, either the optical flow alignment as opposed to, like, using a, conv a convolutional neural net, which would kind of do that automatically for you. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is sort of a prelim preliminary study on uh, the effects of cross-session and uh, I think this is more a simple test to see if it could actually, you know, provide uh, better results. Uh, I think there's definitely more work to be done here. This is just sort of a, a stepping stone towards something better. So hi, uh, uh, I'm Su Jin Zhang from Purdue University. So like, uh, so we all have different sizes of muscles, and the distribution of the muscle units are different per person. Yeah. So have you ever looked at such individual difference in your like study? Uh, there are certainly individual differences, yeah. And for that reason, uh, we had to do like a user-dependent study. Um, yeah, I think maybe in the future you might have to do some sort of calibration mechanism and see, um, you know, where each finger kind of affects the image. Um, but yeah, I don't know if it's going to be possible to have uh, an easy, generalized sort of uh, classifier for everyone. Okay, thanks.